Hello and welcome to GM Tips. This is GM Rick here. Um, take two. I'm going to try to do this again. I tried to do round one on the haunts and uh, incorporeal undead. And so I wanted to just really go back through and try to do a, a deep dive into the basic things of the undead and, and what are you going to be up against. So keep in mind, there are some really cool things that you can do designing your campaign around incorporeal undead. Great. Good. I'm glad you found the pig and everything. So we got a little Moana. So you will hear um, <laughs> mini GM in the background. All right. So in talking with you on the two different types of things you can have in your campaign, and again, this is kind of a dive into undead and designing challenges around undead. And the reason why I picked the things that I picked is for a reason. They're much more challenging when facing. Now, a lot of times you guys will design campaigns um, with challenges around traps and different things like that. Most GMs um, are very used to doing that. And so, again, a lot of people will put a lot of time into some really cool and challenging traps. Well, I think... Even a cooler trap, especially if you're flavoring your campaigns to have undead and um, the, the undead aspect and the haunt aspect, is to really take advantage of haunts. Some systems do that. Um, mind you, they, like for instance, Open Legend RPG and um, Numenera. Both of them are easy to design a haunt around because most everything has difficulty classes. And so difficulty classes become a huge part of things, as well as saves and things like that. So, you know, like, for instance, with Numenera, their saves are the DC saves, the difficulty class. So when you design your haunts, it's really easy to do. Um, and you can do the damage, the set damage amounts and everything else for them, which makes it really easy to do. You have to kind of scale it down from what I'm going to talk about from Pathfinder and Dungeons and & Dragons, because, again, you don't want to do... 40 and 30 points of damage to someone in that game. Otherwise, they'll be quite dead <laughs> and not coming back anytime soon. So keep that in mind. You, you don't want to do that necessarily. Now, Open Legend RPG, you can do a little more with that. You can really set that and scale it in such a way so, again, you're not killing off your characters. That's not what you're trying to do with these haunts. Haunts are basically a spiritual, residual, un, unresolved energy of, um, of uh, I want to call it almost like a psychic or spiritual energy that lingers after something has died and died tragically usually and horrifically and sometimes with a lot of anger or vehemence or unfinished business. So that goes into a haunt. When you design those, keep that in mind. A great show to watch if you haven't watched them is Paranormal um, Witness or... Um, the uh, Haunted series. Those will give you a lot of ideas of different types of haunts um, that, are, that are real in real life people talk about. So you can use those in the aspects of the game. Now, Paizo Publishing and their GM guide does a great definition, I think, on a haunt. It says, the distinction between a trap and an undead creature blurs when you introduce a haunt, a hazardous region created by an unquieted spirit, uh, spirit's that react violently to the presence of the living. So basically, a haunt without the presence of the living goes on, but there's no necessarily violent reaction. It's just playing through like almost a reel on a camera where you're seeing a black and white where it's playing back what happened. However, because there is such a sadness and anger when a living element is introduced in living energy, the haunt senses it. And so that's the thing that you're coming up against when you're designing these, is it's going to detect the presence of the living creatures. Now, some great adventure paths that, that talk about doing haunts. Carrying crown number one, um, the, the, uh, the, the first one of that path does a great job because it has a, a, a prison that has haunts associated with it. So keep in mind, it's the first introduction of haunts that I saw majorly into an adventure in such a way that made it easy to follow. Now, the basic mechanics of a haunt. So I'm going to hit those real quick. The basic 
things are the haunt name, how much XP is awarded, it has an alignment and an area of effect, so you're going to put an alignment associated with it, unless, of course, you're playing a system that doesn't have alignments. So then you can just say it's malevolent. It is definitely malevolent. So if something's trying to detect if it's good or bad, they're going to see it's bad. Um, and that comes in for like a detection spell or a detection aura from a player character so that they can detect something is not right. Um, it has a caster level, so that's dependent on your system and if you have levels, okay? But basically, if you're trying to use magic to dispel a haunt, divine magic, this gives you the level that has to be overcome to affect it. And now, necessarily, it doesn't mean you dispel it forever. It just means for that day, you've, you've taken care of the haunt, so it doesn't manifest itself. Um, the DC for noticing. So you want to put a difficulty... And usually it's going to be some sort of a will save, a perception save, a perceptive ability, something that has to do with spotting something before it actually manifests. So you're looking at the things around you and maybe shaking objects and other things that are telling you something's going to happen. And it warns you so you're not shocked and surprised because normally a haunt will surprise a player character if they're not looking around and not ready for it. Um, how many hit points it has. So, depending on your system and whether you have hit points or not, you're going to assign something to it. Now, Paizo recommends with Pathfinder is a non-persistent haunt is two times its challenge rating, the CR. They assign CRs to it. Now, so does D&D. &D. So, it can either be two times if it's something that's easily taken care of or four and a half times if it is a persistent they use the word persistent, which means it's going to reoccur nightly or daily or ever so many hours. It's going to come back. So those are just the hit points to dispel it for that period of time before it comes back. Um, what weakness it has. So certain spells, certain abilities let you hide from the undead. This is where this comes into play. And it gives you a chance to avoid the persistent haunt noticing you and zeroing in on you. Um, the trigger, what is it? Is it a close proximity? Is it a certain alignment? Is it a certain distance that once you or, or you pick up an object? That's what triggers the haunt coming into effect. Um, how often does it reset? So it's got a reset time. So you're going to put a reset in there. What causes it to reset? Um, and then the effect, what kind of effects are it? Does it summon things? Does it cause damage? Does it damage Ability scores, does it give you a save versus death, is it a fear effect, is it a stun effect, is it, you know, something else that has to do, does it charm you? What is the haunt doing to that is affecting the player characters and the things involved with it? And then how to destroy it. Do you have to put something into a grave? Do you have to bury something? Do you have to resolve an unresolved thing? In some cases, they, they'll say... This creature lost its major sword, so bringing the sword back allows it to find rest. Or knowing it's in the hands of somebody good finds rest. Or you have to um, bury the things a certain way and perform a certain, certain ritual to give it rest. So these are all effects that go with it. Mind you, this is taking the place of your trap. So you want to really place this up. This effect is pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the Paizo things that go along with it. If you want to read up on this, go into the GM's guide and look under Haunts, the section under Haunts. So it'll be under the SRD or the PRD online that you can go to at Paizo's website. Um, and you can put it into a lot of systems. It's, it's a D20-based system, so it's real easy to throw it into something else. Now, other systems like GURPS and some of the others may already have these type of things that are involved. Again, I don't play GURPS as much, so I can't tell you. But keep in mind, these are really cool things that you can do. And they're different than traps, because unlike having to disarm a trap, these are things that are more dangerous they're more haunting. They bring chills. They can mess with sanity. So if you describe your characters, and I, and I do say that, if you're going to do a horror setting, do sanity scores. For the simple systems like D&D, World, Dungeon World, 13th Age, and um, Paizo Pathfinder, your sanity is your charisma score 
plus your intelligence score plus your wisdom score. So the raw scores. So if it's a 17 wisdom, 12 um, charisma, 10, or 10 um, wisdom, put those all together. So that gives you a 39. So that's your threshold. That's that's when you everything falls apart. If you go damage below that, you're just nutty in a fruitcake, and there's no coming back easily without a limited wish or some type of major restoration. Um, then your threshold for the day to get some sort of malady or psychosis is your highest ability score of the three. So say your wisdom is the highest, and it's a 17. That's how much you can take in a single day before you begin to develop a psychosis, whether it's minor or major. I love that effect, and, and these kind of haunts can affect that. I love it because what is it going to do? It's going to drive you crazy. What would anything like that do in real life? It'd drive you nuts. And so heroes will be like, your PCs are going to battle you, and they're going to tell you, oh, no, I, th I run into those things all the time. I eat them for breakfast. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's, uh, that is the biggest fallacy. Let me tell you, as a GM, I hate when players tell me, well, I can face that. I'm a hero. Can you now? Okay. Sure. Let me take a real-life hero and throw them into a haunted area that they have nothing and no idea how to deal with. And let's see how sane they are at the end of it. Probably not. Look at all your horror shows. Most people are not unscarred. I don't care how strong they are. I don't care if they're He-Man or She-Ra. They are not unscarred by the time they come through it. Because it is so shaking and unnerving that even if you are high level, it still messes with you. It, I, I love that there used to be a video game. and I forget the name of the video game. It was on um, GameCube. And it was a Call of Cthulhu type of game. And every time you saw like these undead or incoperior or weird things, it shook with your sanity. And slowly but surely, you started seeing weird visions and had weird effects when your sanity was so damaged. And, and you had a little meter that showed you your sanity was going. And it was so freaking cool. So every time you defeated one of these creatures, your sanity got better. But every time you lost to one of them or took serious damage, your sanity went down. And that's the way it should be. I like that as a GM. So keep that in mind. You're the GM of your table. Set the ground rules from the very beginning. And, and if players argue with you, you just lay it down. Look, guys, come on. I know this is a fantasy game, but in real life, you and I both know if you were thrown into this situation, it would freak you out to no end. And you wouldn't know what to do especially if it wasn't something easy to resolve. So keep that in mind. When you, when you play up these effects, make it nastily, majorly nasty. Um, and again, the, one of the books that you can find on Paizo that talks about haunts and going to specifics, there are five that I'm aware of. The Occult Adventures book, the um, GM's Guide, the Horror Adventures. Also, the Carrion Crown first module has it. And then there is the Strange Aeons that mentions a few of these type of haunts as well. So those are the ones that I'm aware of. There are others that are out there. But those are the ones, at least, that I'm aware of that have the most information on haunts. Um, now, the Undead Slayers book. Love this guy. It's, it's a player companion for Paizo. For a D20 system, really easy to use. And what it does is it discusses um, Undead Paraphernalia. So here's, here's your outfitted undead slayer, or necromancer, and it's got all that type of stuff. So you've got all kinds of different uh, bombs and scalpels and other things. So it talks about the undead, and I love it has dealing with haunts. So it has how you deal with them. And, and you can turn your players into tool or the toolkit for dealing with these types of undead. So like with a mindless undead... They've got, oh, look, things to battle them. I loved it. Necrosalt and other types of things. Um, incorporeal undead, ectoplasmic things, and the different things that you're going to battle the undead with. You got If you're going to have characters that are going to encounter these things, you've got to give them things to battle with. So take these items. Take a look at these items. This, is, this book 
is $12.99 hardcover. $7.99, I believe, or $9.99 on the PDF. Get it and look through it. Look through the different types of things that aid you. Now, the Horror Adventures has additions on this that give you more types of things for battling the undead. It's a $9.99 PDF. Get it. Okay? I'm just telling you. There's certain things in books you should have that you use across systems. So there you go. Now, that's Haunts and Undead Slayers. A little bit of tidbits. Now we're going to touch the Incorporeal Undead. What are the Incorporeal Undead? These are things that are hard to damage. They, When you swing your sword, even a magical sword, you have a 50% chance of missing. A regular sword, you're not going to touch them. You just won't. You're not going to damage them. Magical weapons, you got a 50-50 chance of damaging an undead that's in Kapiri. Unless it's, specific, unless it's a ghost touch type of item. They have certain types of things in systems that they'll call ghost touch or they'll use a different name. In, in, but D&D, the two primary ones, D&D and, and Pathfinder, those. Numenera, it'll have its own little artifact. So you can create an artifact. Um, you can do the same like uh, in Deadlands Reloading. You can do like a blessed weapon or something like that um, in Savage Worlds. You could use in a, in a hero campaign kind of same things, blessed weapons, holy weapons. You have a chance to harm them. But remember, they're a ghost. They're, they're, they're energy. They're spirit energy, whether positive or negative. So your ghosts, your wraiths, your specters, your alephs, um, your uh, dread wraiths, your, um, uh, in this case, they have a Darnock in here. A Darnock is one of the new types of undead that um, Tome of Horror has, or these type of incorporeal undead. Um, I'm going to pull another one. So I'm going to give you a couple different names, because these are books that, as you get them, they're going to have these incorporeal undead and new things. Um, let's see. What is it? Uh, up, 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 up. They've got so many cool things. Um, is it Aswang? Yes. Um, nope. And Aswang's a living corporeal one. I always love it. I go through these books. And, and again, for me, they're just cool little things that I can take out and put something new that my players don't know. Um, yes, a burning gat. A burning gat is um, a rare form of undead, usually in negative energy. So it's kind of an incorporeal. It's not quite... It, it's it's going that direction. Um, but you want to look up all the ones. Um, yes, a Simota. Simota is a incorporeal undead. And so you really want to look for these type of creatures. Why is that? Because they are hard to damage. And you'll say, um, manifestation or incorporeal. When they mention that, there's a 50-50 chance of your players missing these. So it's a, it's a greater challenge. And usually they're persistent. Most of them are what they call persistent undead. So persistent undead, okay, so you defeat them in the here and now. They're coming back. Because there's some reason they keep coming back and reforming. So you kill a ghost, it reforms. I love that. Um, there's a d, &D adventure that has a ghost in it that was recently produced that I was working on. The ghost, no matter how many times you kill him, keeps coming back, keeps reforming. There's only one way to put him to rest, and you have to figure that out. And see, for me as a GM, I love that, because then your players have to dig in and, and get the history of why is this ghost coming back? What unresolved business is there? And how can I help them to resolve their business? Because you don't truly ever defeat them. You don't get, this, you don't get the experience until you defeat them. So now your players are de dealing with something that, okay, now they've dispelled it the first time, it's coming back, and it's coming back for them, because they're the target. They've just painted a target onto them by defeating it the first time. So it's looking for their auras. It, it, it looks for their very auras, and it's coming back for them when it manifests, because it wants them. And unless it's tied to a certain area, and unless the players hightail it out of there, that haunt's coming after them, that particular ghost or wraith or specter. Now, on some of them, you can defeat them and, they're, and dead is dead. But ghost is not that way. Specters, wraiths, yes. Other things, not always. Sometimes dead is not dead. You have to do some sort of a ritual or other type of thing to put them to rest. 
And that's true of many incorporeal undead, unlike corporeal undead, where, you know, you drive a stake through the heart. Now, vampires are like that. The, unless you do it the right way, the right ritual, they're coming back. And they're coming back after you and hungrily. So that's what you got to remember as a GM. It adds to the spice and the fun. Decorate your ghosts for a reason. Give them a reason for why they are what they are and why they keep coming back. And make it challenging for the players. Make them use their skills and their abilities to figure it out. Unless the ghost will tell them, and they usually don't. Unless well convinced. They're going to have to figure it out. They're going to have to dig into the legends and the different reasons of why this undead just keeps coming back, no matter what. So, my challenge to you guys is to use more haunts and incorporeal undead as challenges in their campaign. They make for a very fun and scary campaign. Set your mood. Get your lights low. Get your music, weird music on. Get all these things going and then introduce these situations. It is the coolest thing when you do this. Because the players will think, oh yeah, it's a ghost. I got this. Do you now? Okay. The first time you do. <laughs> when it comes back the second time, you're not going to feel so confident. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth. And that's when the sanity starts to give out. And the sanity damage gets taken. Because I should have killed that. Why is it coming back? Why is it messing with me? Why is it now dealing this? Why, why, why? Sanity. Get to know the word and love it. They got enough sanity tables between Call of Cthulhu um, from Chaosium and from Paizo that you can figure out in the horror adventures how you want to use sanity in your campaign. How it's going to get damaged. How does it get repaired? What do you got to do? What rituals do you have to take it through? How do you heal it over time? Now you've added new, new twists and turns in your campaign. So thanks. Everybody have a great weekend of gaming, and we'll talk to you soon.